Hi everybody, so let's get into some numbers to actually see how this works. So here's your example. January 1st, 2009, Matrix Inc. signed a five-year lease with RentPro for equipment. The lease specifies annual payments of $6,000 beginning 1109 at each December 31st, okay? Uh, equipment ha has an economic life of five years and a fair value of 25873 The equipment reverts back to RentPro at the end of the lease. So it doesn't meet that first criteria that the owner, that the lessee takes ownership, all right? Matrix has an incremental borrowing rate of 8%, which is the same as the implicit rate used by RentPro to calculate the annual payment. All right, so that's the interest rate we're using. Now, the second criteria, if I remember correctly, was the bargain purchase option. Nothing here is mentioned, so here's finally where we get to actually look at criteria three and four. Well, criteria number three was whether or not you use the item for 75% or more of its useful life. So, if you look at this, the 75%, the economic life of the assets five years, 75% of that, so five years times 75% is three and three quarters of a year, of three and three quarter years. <laughs> um, the lease term's five. So the lease term of five years is more than 75% of the economic life of the equipment. So you've met this test. Really, that's what all it takes to make sure that this is a capital lease. But it does take you for an example of the second part of this test with the present, or not the second part, the four, number four criteria which was the present value of the payments are greater than or equal to 90% of the equipment's fair value. So the minimum lease payments were $6,000. And the present value of the annuity due, and it's an annuity due you're looking at here because the first payment of the lease needs to be made on the first day of the lease. All right, so you enter into this lease and you have to pay $6,000 on that first day. Since you're dealing with that, you're looking at an annuity due table, not an annuity, all right? not an ordinary annuity. So it's $6,000, it's five periods at 8% because that first period, well, all right, so five periods at 8%. So that, because that's how many periods you're compounding here. If you look it up, the annuity factor, the annuity due factor is 4.31213 of the present value table. All right, the present value of those payments is 25873 Well, the fair value of the equipment is the 25873 So it's actually equal, which is certainly greater than 90%. Um, but just to show you, 90% of the fair value of the equipment at least inception, so the fair value of the equipment at least inception is the 25873 90% of that number is 23286 So even if this calculation gave you 23287 or even 23286 it is still the present value of the payments is greater than or equal to 90% of the equipment's fair value. So it has also met this test, okay? So that's how you calculate the, that piece of it. So at the inception of the lease, the lessee records the equipment that they've got. They have debit to leased equipment and it's an asset to them. It does go on their books. Whereas if you're dealing with an operating lease, the asset never goes on the books. It's simply rent expense and cash, all right? But because we're basic, a capital lease is kind of like you're transferring the ownership of the property, and that's really what it is, you need to record it, the lessee needs to record it on their books. So you've got a debit to lease equipment and a credit to lease payable for the present value of the payments. All right, that's 25873 And their first payment here, that $6,000, I mentioned that you need to make a payment for this on the first day of the lease, January 1st. No interest has accrued yet because it's the first payment. So you've got a debit to lease payable, credit to cash. On the lessor side, oh, the lessor side, remember they have those two additional criteria, whether or not it is a direct financing lease or a sales type lease, all right? And we're gonna talk about those criteria a little bit more in the future, but um, the lesser rent pro knows the collectability of the lease payments is reasonably predictable and there are no future costs to be incurred. That was five and six there. Um, well, I'm calling them five and six, but really it's the first two on the lessor's criteria that they need to make sure they meet these as well. Um, RentPro is not a manufacturer or dealer, and that's important because that's going to be the difference between whether or not it is, a it is a direct financing lease or a sales lease. So if RentPro is not a manufacturer or dealer and the cost of equipment is 25873 because they are not a manufacturer or dealer, you're dealing with a direct financing lease. It's kind of like a loan here. They're not selling, they're not looking to make money on it, they're just leasing the equipment, all right? Well, not looking to make money, they are still making money from the interest perspective, but they're not selling it as well. All right, so um, if it's a direct financing lease, as I mentioned, because they're not actually selling it, um, they're not a manufacturer or dealer, 
their journal entry on their side is at least receivable for the full amount because it's an asset to them and they're crediting the inventory of equipment. They're taking that equipment inventory off their books um, and they get their cash and they have the least receivable part with no interest. Same as, same as the flip side, the lessee's journal entry. All right, so looking at the amortization table on this, Here's your first payment, or here's the outstanding balances, 25873. Realize this is January 1st, 2009, the inception of it, and here is also another payment, January 1st, 2009, there's the $6,000. So you're gonna take this right off the top with no interest. So 25873 less that $6,000 you're paying right away from the get-go is 19873. Now you're gonna start dealing with that interest rate. So you're gonna take 19873 at 8%, here we go, and that would give you the 1590. It's one year, so you don't have to do anything else uh, to prorate it or anything. So it's 19873 at the 8%. It's going to give you 1590. Your payment $6,000. So the difference between the two is the decrease in the in the outstanding balance, the 4410. So now you're going to take 19873 minus the 4410 gives you 15463. This is the same type of amortization table you've been looking at. The only difference being this initial payment, the first one. Okay, so, oh, okay, so we're dealing with, okay, okay, here's the journal entry for December 31st, 2009. So here's this first set of numbers, this 1590 and the 4410. All right, for matrix side of things, they get interest, uh, they're paying interest expense of 1590. They're reducing their lease obligation to 4410 because they do owe the money, it is a liability, and they've got a credit to cash of $6,000. Whereas on rent pro side, they're getting cash, yay, $6,000. They've got interest revenue and they're decreasing their lease receivable. Okay. Let's talk about depreciation for a second. Depreciation by the lessee. Realize that if you're dealing with a capital lease here, it's like the ownership of the, of the asset has transferred to the lessee, right? That's the, def that's the idea, of the whole idea behind a capital lease. So if that's the case, the lessee is the one who has carried on their books and they have to record depreciation then. So um, you would depreciate the same way you would normally would in your business. The other thing is, is if the title, here we go, if title passes to the lessee at the end of the lease term or the lease contains a bargain purchase option, all right? So that's the first two criteria here. The asset is depreciated over the asset's economic life because there's really no question that this asset is going to wind up on the books of the lessee, right? Because bargain purchase option, you'd be silly not to buy it, right? And if it passes at the end of the lease term, this thing is absolutely no question going to wind up on the lessee's books. Then if that's the case, you're, you're going to depreciate over the entire economic life. Even if you're only depreciate, even if your lease is only for five years and the asset's good for 10, all right? Um, but if it's three and four, right? The 75% and the 90% of the min of the minimum lease payments, then you're going to depreciate over the lease term because this asset isn't necessarily going to stay on the lessee's books. It might go back to the lessor at the end. So therefore you want to depreciate over the term of the lease. The journal entry for that is the same as any depreciation journal entry would be. If you're using straight line, you didn't have any sort of residual uh, value then your journal entry would be a debit to depreciation expense, a credit to accumulated depreciation, the asset you put on the books for the fair market value, no, the minimum lease payments, the present value, that's what I want to say, of the minimum lease payments of 25873 divided by five years, you've got depreciation of 5175 every year. Okay, no different than any other straight line calculation, except this one has no residual value. All right, so the example that we just looked at was for a direct financing lease. What if you have a sales type lease? And the idea of a sales type lease is that you have an actual sale along with a lease component, all right? So you're dealing with a manufacturer or a dealer here. So let's look at an example. So we've got the same information that we had in the previous example. The only difference is, is that, let's see, uh, I think all this is the same. No, wait a second, I'm missing something. Equipment has the least specified annual payments, same thing through here. The equipment has an economic life. Oh, here we go. The equipment has a cost basis in the hands of RentPro for 19873. So this asset is worth 25873. I'm sorry, but you're but they have a cost basis because they are a dealer or a manufacturer. They're selling it for 19870. I'm sorry. They're selling it for a what? $6,000 gain. 
So the journal entry for the lessee in this case doesn't really change. You've got leased equipment, lease, lease payable, and they make their first lease payable $6,000 payment credit to cash. On the lessor side of things, you do have a bit more going on because it is a sales type lease. So you have lease receivable, that hasn't changed. But here's the thing, you're going to record sales revenue for the 25873. You can do this in two pieces. You could do lease receivable, sales revenue, and then a debit to cost of goods sold because it's worth 19873 and it credits the inventory equipment. This is the same as you would have if you had a regular um, journal entry for sale. Sales journal entries are always, you know, debit to the receivable, credit to revenue, and then debit to cost of goods sold, credit to the inventory. So they've combined it into one. I kind of like looking at it as two separate ones, but um, they did combine it into one, but it does have the same result. And they record the cash and lease receivable. So the difference here is that you're dealing with a seller or you're dealing with a manufacturer or um, a seller of the product. So they not only are selling it for, they're not only getting the money of interest uh, for the payment, but they're actually making a gain on the original sale as well.